I don't know if you've had the pleasure or the penance of going on a hike with small children. But it is an engagement that requires a lot of will. Going up the mountain, leaving the comfort of the refrigerator and air conditioning and video games, some children being pried from the home, eventually get to the point where they like it, or they just never stop complaining. And you, the parent, have to negotiate with the will of your child to say, if I carry Junior now, do I have to carry him for the next two and a half miles? Or can we do the next quarter mile, and then what can we do thereafter? The church recognizes that children reach the age of reason by age seven. In some, it crops up earlier. But this is the ability to choose to disobey or to choose to make a big deal about something or to choose not to sacrifice. Now, an unintentional form of raising kids can remove the fine-tuning of how that works in the life of the child, and the reverse is also the case. That with intentional parenting and the ability to see consequences, a child can look at how his or her will impacts the life of others. This is the beauty of and the challenge of what it is to be a parent. To help your children engage their own will, not to do it for them. To enliven them to rise to the level of the challenge that's before them. So that one day when they go to the altar and they say yes and they mean yes, they have the capacity to live the yes that they said and meant. What we have in today's readings is actually a beautiful display of human will. And just like some children learn that if they make a big deal about something, they can throw the circumstances in their own power. They can manipulate things to get what they want. Some children, at the age of 35, never grow out of that skill. <laughs> and so you have adults who learn that if they make a big deal about something, they can have it their way, Burger King style. The opening reading says, as the number of disciples continued to grow, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. This is a moment in the early church, right? Jesus ascends to the Father. Then 10 days later, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, descends, granting wisdom to the 11, no longer the 12, apostles, who are at this point bishops in the church. The Holy Spirit impels them to go forward. 3,000 are added to the church that day. You want to talk about a startup company? Try going from 11 to 3,000. And so organization is needed in some way, so that when Peter goes that way, when John goes that way, when Thomas goes that way, when Jude goes that way, how do they maintain that which Jesus gave them? How are they faithful to what the Lord asked them to do? And so they stay unified in prayer. You have the Hellenists complaining that their own widows are being neglected. So way before Social Security, families used to have to take care of their own elderly. And so there were ways of neglecting the elderly such that the Christians said, we will do this ourselves. And so at the early church masses, they would take a collection, not just of money, but of food, of eggs, of straw, of whatever that could be used for the community. And it was redistributed in such a way that all had what they needed. What a beautiful way of living the church. The apostles had too much to do. Good thing we fixed that problem in the life of the church today. 
they invented the diaconate to solve this. So you have bishops and you have deacons at this point. Deacons were men called forth to administer the church good so that the apostles could reread all of the scriptures in light of Jesus and understand what was going on. And then to say, how do we form the church by which the Savior seeks to save the world? Now you have a squabble. The Hellenists, which is not a group, a club of women named Helen, it is the Greeks, the Gentiles. So if you know anything about the New Testament, St. Paul talks all the time about the covenant of the Lord being made applicable to all people. Go back to the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name is turned to Israel. He has 12 sons. Becomes the nation of Israel. Become enslaved in Egypt. The Lord liberates them. Takes them, 40 years later, to the promised land. This is the nation from whom was to come the liberator and savior of the world. Their constant infidelity to the Lord, the Lord gives them over to the hands of their enemies without fully abandoning them but allows them to feel the consequences of their own actions. And so it's in, the, it's in the Hebrew mindset that the worldwide blessing is to come from the Jews. Jesus comes along from the Jews, he who himself is the worldwide blessing, and then cracks it open for the entirety of the world. And so the Gentiles, basically literally everyone who's not Jewish, that the saving power of God is meant for them as well. This is a change in the Hebrew mindset. And so, of course, there would be squabbles. Of course, there would be people that say, do we have to include them as well? They smell funny. They eat weird things. They don't speak our language. They don't do what we do. They don't even know what Shabbat is. The Sabbath of the Hebrew religion. And you had some people who rose to the occasion of including those who were outside the circle to begin with, and others who chose to make a big deal about it. And so the apostles gathering together in prayer formed the diaconate so that all might be taken care of. Let's pause and do a quick lesson on Philosophical anthropology. It's not as boring as it sounds. You and I are comprised of intellect, will, and passions. Our intellect is our ability to see and understand the world around us, to make sense of it. Our free will allows us to make choices. It's the faculty by which we can love. Love is not a feeling, despite every 80s song you've ever heard. Love is not a feeling. And so love is the choice to do something good for another, even if it has nothing to do with your own good, even if it might, in a sacrificial sense, impinge your own good for a time. Thus, love is not a feeling, it's a choice. You can't love accidentally, you can't love in your sleep. It has to be fully chosen. That's exactly the same way sin works. You can't sin accidentally, and you can't sin in your sleep. Sin results only from a free choice. That's why God cares so much about sin, and that's why I don't fear preaching about it. Because the opposite of sin is love. And why wouldn't I want my flock to engage their hearts to be able to Love, not just by way of feeling, but by way of free moral action. The third ingredient would be passions. And passions is not, I'm passionate about photography or fresh Italian noodle making. Your passions are that which you are made passive to. So let's take the example of hunger. Hunger arises every couple of hours, and you are made passive to that feeling. It acts upon you, impresses itself into you, and then you either reach for something healthy or something vastly not healthy. 
according to your intellect and according to your choice. How you deal with what rises within you affects who you are and who you become. So to the rest of the interior actions within a human being, these would be the rest of the passions, especially fear and anger. But also including that, attraction, aversion, hope, despair. None of those are either good or bad. They are by themselves morally neutral. It's what we do with them that is either good or bad. A lot of us actually were raised or picked up this mindset that anger is bad. Anger is a God-given drive towards justice and restoration in the face of evil. Some of us believe it's bad because we've been wounded by the poor use of anger in the lives of others. But if you spend your whole life trying to push away your anger, you won't be able to do what God is asking you to do. And so you have, within the human being, free will that allows one to ride one's emotions for the sake of something good. Okay, we've arrived to the gospel. Jesus says to his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Here he is in the midst of John chapter 14, which is the scene in which Lazarus dies. His friend dies. And so he's speaking to a community of people gathered together in mourning. The shortest verse in the entirety of the scripture says, and Jesus wept. So what Jesus is not telling them when he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, he's not saying, push away your sadness, turn that frown upside down. It's time to be peppy. Jesus legitimizes humanity, which means we are able to feel the full gamut of human emotion. So what does he mean when he says, don't let your hearts be troubled? Go back to human will. Sometimes you and I have emotions that well up with inside of us, from inside of us, because of whatever circumstance. And sometimes we can choose to do something about it or make it worse. We can choose to stoke our anger. To be resentful, which means res and tire, to feel something again and again. We can choose to fight with people before we meet up with them and really get ourselves revved up. My friends, we are only a few months from the start of the political season for November of 2024. And I've dropped hints here and there the past couple of months that this time would be coming. And in certain parishes throughout the archdiocese, especially those that open themselves up to greater diversity, this is a time in which people's hearts, people allow their hearts to be troubled. And let me just say that the news media outlets profit from the troubling of your heart. The more they can grab upon you and stoke your fears or increase a narrative that it's their fault and not theirs, the more that the Hellenists can be divided from the Jews, the more that the Democrats can be divided from the Republicans, the more that you and I can enter into an us versus them paradigm, the more we begin to process reality through fear or anger. And then something happens and then we can choose to let our hearts be troubled. But Jesus is giving us exactly the opposite command. Choose not to let your hearts be troubled. That doesn't mean don't feel sadness, don't feel anger. What it means is allow your anger to rouse you to prayer. To rouse you to do something good in the face of something evil. You know how you, we all have that one family member who, in the midst of a funeral, in the midst of Thanksgiving, in the midst of some kind of party, just makes a big deal about his or her own serving. Why do I have to do this all by myself? Why am I the queen or king of the dishwasher? Why do I whatever it is? Choosing to let one's heart 
be troubled, as opposed to saying, hey, would you help me? Jesus cares so much about our hearts because what we choose, not what we feel, what we choose defines so much of who we are and how you and I engage our relationship with God, our relationship with others, our relationship with this physically created world, and most complexly, our relationship with ourselves. What Jesus is saying is, Choose not to enter into useless human drama. And so I say this to you way before the election of any pope or president happens in the future. Because a time will come again in which you and I are tempted to be divided or tempted to say it's these people's fault and not my own. We will be tempted to allow our hearts to be troubled and scattered. And the very name of Satan, Ho Diabolos, is he who scatters. Whereas if we attend to the troubles of our heart, offering them first to the Lord, it's him who brings healing, him who brings nourishment, him who brings what we need so as to be united, so as to be free from human drama, or as we say immediately after the, our Father, safe from all distress. And so my friends, in this very Mass, in which you and I lift up our hearts, we lift them up to the Lord because it is right and just. Offer the troubles of your heart. Be willing to repent, which is its own choice, from the ways in which you add to the scenes of human drama. Seek first, rather, to heal and to be healed. And then the Lord will work powerfully through you in the pockets of humanity in which you find yourselves. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Let us stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. Oftentimes when I preach homilies that have both theological import and then an immediate practical something or another, people start thinking, oh, Father saw me in the pew and he switched his homily just because he saw me. <laughs> You're so vain. You probably think this homily's about you, don't you? Yeah, okay. So, I don't write my homily and change it at the last minute because I see so-and-so's in the pews. If you have any kind of that temptation, that's just the Holy Spirit that's like highlighting, underlining something in your life, right? All human beings are composed of will and passions and intellect. And so hopefully something I said tonight does correspond with something of your experience in your life. And then if you want to like take that seriously, then you can do what our closing prayer says, which is to pass from former ways like human drama to newness of life, the freedom of the children of God. I just say all of that to say, if it resonated with you, praise Jesus. If not, pray for me or start paying attention at Mass. I'd say one of the last thoughts that I leave you with from today's homily. When Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled, right? consenting to living in fight or flight mode for much of your life dehumanizes a person. If everything is either a conflict to be entered into with some kind of force or to be run from, then that's going to rob a person of his or her humanity. That's one of many reasons Jesus says, choose not to let your hearts be troubled. That doesn't mean to say, go through life happy clappy, but it's to say, he's savior of your souls and your burdens. He's safe to bring the troubles of your life too. And if you do that, your hearts will not remain troubled. If you and I lose our humanity by way of living in fight or flight, by way of sin, by way of refusal to live in relationship, then that costs us who we are. Rather, most of the time when you and I live in anger or fear, 
One of the steps that we know deep down needs to happen, that most of us don't love, is we need to vulnerably offer to someone what's going on in here. Your marriage should be the safest place for your heart to reside other than the confessional, this side of heaven. If it's not, then you need help in your marriage, even if you're 80 years old. And I'm doing marriage prep for an 80-year-old couple. They're awesome. If your marriage is not the safest place for your heart to reside this side of heaven, then you need help. Not just sacramental grace, but you might need to talk it out. That's what Father Micah and I are here for. And or, if you don't like going to people who are younger than you, we have relationships with other priests, therapists, things of that nature. But to live in fight or flight, to live in sin, to live without vulnerability, robs each of us of our humanity and prevents us from being who we truly are. Jesus wants a flourishing, vivacious, fun, awesome, holy, none of those things are apart from each other. To live a life with him. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.